about the talent case, um, the the working population that is entering the the market now is comprises of Generation Z, right? And you speak to anybody in Gen Z, and they will so they will say that DEI is a given, right? And if an organization is not talking about DEI, very quickly you will become very very unattractive to the talent that is there in the market. So if you as a company want to be an employer of choice, if you want to be um, uh, an employer that is moving with the times, you have to talk about DEI. You have to have policies that are inclusive. You have to have representation in terms of employees that represent these communities. So that's really the talent case of DEI. And culture case? Of course, is, you know, when you have employees from different communities, different backgrounds, because you wanted to bring in diversity, let's say, right? But you did not make them feel included. You did not make them feel respected, heard, valued. They thought they thought that they could not be authentic. You know, when they come to work, they have to hide a certain aspect of their personality just in order to fit in. Then DEI is just, just lip service. So I think. An even bigger component of the whole diversity agenda is the inclusion agenda, because you get all this diversity, but this diversity needs to stay, it needs to perform, which is the whole premise of it. So I think companies need to work more on, on inclusion uh, than diversity, creating the right environment so that this diversity thrives and the company benefits. So um, that that's why companies need to prioritize if you're if you are uh, there is we all agree a war of war for talent we want to get the best talent working for us we want to create an organization that breeds uh, inclusive culture right and for that the is very important right thank you richard it's a very beautiful very relevant point i mean i think all of us are uh, experiencing this now the future talent the uh, Gen Z, uh, for them, this is a given. So, uh, I mean, you can't really uh, take this away from the DNA of the, the core of the organization as such, and then uh, talk it as a uh, as an exclusive thing. So it's a very, very, uh, very beautifully put, Richa. So, uh, you know, the, uh, my, our next question uh, would be, how should go? Uh, why should, how should one go about laying the foundation of a workplace that's inclusive? Uh, you know, we can have a lot of these, um, uh, you know, resources in place. We can have, uh, uh, we can have a lot of these discussion sessions and all of these. But how to, you know, make a workplace truly inclusive? Mm, that is the golden question. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of companies struggle with that, Vigneshwari. And I think um, the tone has to be set from the top, right? It's very, very important for the CEO of the company uh, to sponsor this initiative. And I call that initiative because a lot of companies are still starting on this journey. You know, uh, something that should come to us inherently, but it's not. Inclusion is a choice. Inclusion is a learned skill because naturally we are born with a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say born, but we cultivate a lot of uh, unconscious biases, uh, blind spots. We stereotype people and all of that. And I'm not saying we are bad individuals. We are not, right? It's just the way we grow up to be. And it's, it's only natural and human to have all of these aspects to our personality. And, and now we are saying that, you know, you keep, you, know, you discover your own unconscious biases, you break the stereotypes in your mind, and you discover, um, you know, your blind spots and actually become an inclusive person. So we are actually trying, you know, telling people to do the opposite of what comes naturally to them. Right. So, so like the importance of this, this uh, agenda has to be driven from the top. The CEO has to talk about it in every forum. Um, the CXOs have to be committed and to the idea that, yes, we need diversity. We need to work on inclusion. And then it flows down within the organization. And I, when you talk about setting a right foundation, that's the first step. The second step, I think, is about inclusive policies. Right. Um, 
the organizations were came into being because they were men and they designed organizations for men right and then slowly women started coming in and you know when i speak to very senior women who started their career maybe um you know 40 years ago or 50 years ago it's you know things that i take for granted today for example a woman's washroom a lady's washroom it's a thing that that's for granted but the women who started their career 40 years 50 years ago tell us that you know it was it was not there the washrooms weren't there in offices and they wouldn't drink water because there was no place to go and relieve themselves so because of you know somebody coming in and telling that no this is a requirement we need this in order to bring more women into the workplace and we see history repeating itself when we talk about lgbtq inclusion you know the first thing people from the community uh the transgender community and people from you know the overall lgbt community will tell you that we need to have gender neutral washrooms and a lot of us you know the heterosexual folks will say why are we making a fuss about washrooms but it's such a basic requirement you know and we need to be empathetic we need to understand how basic this is right imagine being and I, and I, and I, that's why i say that empathy is so important imagine being at a place where there is no washroom what would you do it is it is a very very basic thing right we spend about 9 10 hours in office every day right so so the foundation right the very very basic infrastructure when we talk about disability you know how many of our buildings are accessible right and this is physical access what about software you know how many of us our uh, of our softwares of our websites are accessible to people with disability right the government of india recognizes 21 different kinds of disabilities as per the rpwd act how many of us are completely accessible in all aspects right so we need to start thinking differently because when we start th- thinking differently progress happens for everyone right now there have been instances i'll i'll give you i'm deviating i know i'm deviating a bit but i'll give you a small example for example vigneshwari if i was to say that you know i've got a fracture in my leg and there are only steps and i need to go somewhere would it not make life easier for me if there was a ramp and i had to use a wheelchair right so when we think inclusive we actually benefit everyone right so it is not about doing someone a favor oh you know we have to spend so much money in making our building accessible or making our website accessible but it is so important because at the end of the day please remember disability is not people are not only born with disability it can also be acquired right, right. so so hence uh, i think that's just one way of making it real for people but i'm trying to say is that it makes life easier simpler for everyone when we think about these sections of society that are often invisible you know we call the disab- uh, the community with disability mostly as invisible population because we don't even think about it, right but i must recommend uh, you know commend the government they've done some fantastic work and the private uh, sector needs to step up to the occasion you know there's a lot of work that we need to do as the private sector in making sure that our companies our offices are accessible right so basic infrastructure and facilities and then policies right a lot of companies have started talking about menstrual leave you know people are talking about mental health right people are talking about work from home and flexibility yeah all of these things are good for increasing and improving your diversity ratio because you know i remember a while ago let's say if i am a wheelchair user it was very hard for someone like me to come to office uh because you know places are inaccessible public transport is inaccessible but as soon as the pandemic happened and overnight we shifted to work from home for most companies all of these jobs became open to people with disability right because and all of these years these people had been demanding that you know can we work from home and for us that thought was alien 
You know, we said that no, how can work happen from home? But we all saw that. We all saw that during the pandemic. So I think, um, you know, thinking of policies in a more inclusive manner, right? And having those voices in the room. Because you cannot think about inclusive policies if you don't have somebody who's had a lived experience to talk about what are the barriers they face on a daily basis. You know, people thought of menstrual leave because there was a woman in the room who said that, you know, I undergo extreme pain and discomfort and it becomes difficult for me to come to work. Right. And hence, menstrual leave came into being. Right. Right. So you have to have a voice in the room to talk about experiences and hence inclusive policies and benefits can come into place. So that's really the foundation, I think, you know, commitment from the top, the CEO, inclusive policies, benefits and um, infrastructure facilities. Got it, Richard. So uh, you touched upon uh, having the CEO's voice in this. So, uh, you know, can you uh, go a little deeper there? So what role do you see leadership playing in driving diversity, equity, and inclusion? And uh, how can they lead by example? Um, if you could quote any personal examples that you have seen over the years, uh, you know, the drastic changes that happened because of a very, very small initiatives, those kind of things. We would love to hear that, uh, Richa. Sure, sure. So in my current organization also, uh, the CEO uh, CEO himself uh, packs this agenda. It was him who actually brought uh, the, the topic of diversity, uh, equity, inclusion in the organization. But I think one of the most powerful stories that I have seen up close and personal, and you spoke about a story, was the one in my previous organization, which was uh, one of the executive directors was Mr. Keshav Suri. Uh, who heads the Lalit Suri Hospitality Group. And, um, and, and I think, and I'm taking the, the uh, you know, uh, leave in, in mentioning his name, but uh, it, it is only because I saw phenomenal change in the organization when the man from the top decided to talk about DEI in his own company. And I think I could see the whole culture shift you know, there were, it was not a, diff, it was not an easy conversation to have Vigneshwari. You know, we are talking about years of conditioning, years of being fearful of the LGBTQ community, almost, right? Um, in the North, uh, the Hijra community, for example, when they visit our homes, maybe, you know, a child is born or is somebody's marriage, People in the family, we have seen being almost fearful of them, right? And nowadays we see them on traffic signals, right? Almost people are fearful of them. Why is that? And, and so, so we've grown up with those years of conditioning. But suddenly now we're talking about inclusion of them in the workplace. I know a lot of well-qualified, articulate people from the LGBTQ community, and it's been absolute pleasure working with them. But I got to know them because I was working in the field of DEI, you know, and slowly people started getting to know them, my colleagues and then their colleagues. And, and, the, and the perceptions that we carried in our mind, the myths that we carried in our mind slowly started breaking. And we understood that these are people just like us. You know, these are human beings just like us. They have the same aspirations, same joy, same fears, and so on. Of course, their struggles are not the same. You know, there have been years of being discriminated, bullied, harassed almost, right? But um, the, more we, the more we converse with them, the more we talk to them, the more we understand their life story, right? And, the, and, and that's what leads to greater acceptance. Yeah. So um, that's, you know, one story for me where I saw a complete culture shift, you know, people right from the, the frontline staff to the head of the unit, to the head of the company, everybody knew that this is a way of life. This is not something we do when we have time, you know, when all our work is finished and, oh, let's talk about DEI. No, it's not a 
you know, it's not a tick in the box. It's not something that it's not a to do item. It's just a way of life. It's just the way you are. If you're having a meeting and there is not adequate representation, let's say, of the diverse community that exists, then that meeting is not a well represented meeting. Right. Yeah. That is and that's just a small example, you know, so so as the organization became more inclusive and more diverse, we realized that we've actually started attracting customers from that community who found that organization to be a safe organization to be with, you know, so because it was a hotel, right, and we got a lot of customers from the LGBTQ community wanting to check in and stay at the hotel, wanting to get married in the hotel, wanting to come with their chosen families and, and, and have a holiday there, right? Sorry. So um, this, and that is what I was saying that, you know, you discover a customer database that you hadn't even thought about. We started getting people wanting to work with us and ready to come at even the same salary or even a lower salary, because this is the place where they could be their authentic selves. They didn't have to pretend to be someone else. They didn't have to hide a part of, the, of themselves just to fit in, right? So imagine the kind of sacrifice or the kind of covering a person from a community, let's say, and, and I'm not only talking about LGBTQ community, you know, when, when let's say disability, when I see another person like me, if I am a person with disability and I see another person with disability, I feel that, okay, you know, I've got someone who understands. Or for example, even with women, right? There is so much diversity with, within women also, right? Now, a lot of Indian, a lot of companies are still thinking gender is, when we talk about gender, we've spoken about, about diversity. Well, that's only you know, a very small aspect of diversity, right. right? And I'm saying even a big chunk of population like women, even within that, there is so much diversity, right? There are single women, unmarried women, uh, women of all ages, and they all have different needs. You know, now companies are talking about menstrual leave. I'm sorry, I'm saying this for the third time, but now uh, there is also a need for women undergoing menopause. Right. And what kind of medical assistance do they need, right? The government has mandated ma maternity benefits. But what about paternity? What about parental leave, you know? Right. And, and so, so I think um, the, the, uh, the, having the right voices in the room, having um, that's very important. And I think leadership has a big role to play to say that, yes, we are willing to listen to voices other than the homogeneous voices that we have been listening to. So being open to listening, you know, and, and questioning what has been the norm till now. Right. So that's a very big part that leadership has to play. You know, not only just talking, but also active listening and listening to the diverse voices in the room. Um, I think also we, we say that, you know, in, in corporates, whatever gets measured gets, gets uh, improved, right? So understanding what are the levers and what are the metrics that will really move the needle when it comes to diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, and and knowing that that is a part of the whole story and that is not the whole story, you know, it's a part of the whole story. You are working towards pushing more people, more diverse people, and, you know, you're tracking your diversity ratio. Great. Yeah. But how many of them are able to have a long and sustainable career in the organization? What is their voice? What is their employee satisfaction ratio right. what is the career trajectory we are able to make for each one of them what are the learning opportunities you know are we listening to them enough um what kind of tenure do they have in the organization right so so in all basically what i'm referring to is are we building an inclusive environment which is making them stay 
right? Because you do all of this effort and you get the diversity in the room, but they will only stay if there's an inclusive environment in the room. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the leadership has a big role to play. So I think policies like workplace harassment, you know, there is POSH, which is uh, prevention of sexual harassment, but the law says it's only for women. But I think workplace harassment is gender neutral. Right. Right. And uh, are, do we have enough laws, uh, policies to protect people irrespective of their gender? Yeah. So things like this, I think. So I think just looking at everything from your policies to the software you use, to the benefits, to the access, all of that. And that requires, sometimes requires major investments and sometimes exactly. just a change of lens. True, true. Very beautifully put. Uh, you also pointed out about uh, uh, unconscious biases and stereotypes when it comes to hiring only. So, uh, because sometimes people mean well, but probably there is a lot of uh, unconscious bias that one is not aware of. So how can one address that issue? And what do you suggest um, to all of us? Like how uh, probably, you know, I'm, I'm reading a lot. I'm talking about this a lot. And probably I also have some unconscious bias. So how to deal with it? Right. So Vigneshwari, I think um, we are living in the information age. We are very, very lucky. Everything is available at the click of a button. Right. Um, and nowadays you don't even have to click a button. You just have to speak in it. <laughs> so <laughs> we have the voice, uh, voice commands. So I think first and foremost is you have to accept that there is a path to be traversed. You know, that I might think that I'm a very woke person. I'm a very inclusive person. But actually, there's so much that I need to learn and so much that I need to know about other people. And, and, and that's, and I'm not saying that that's anybody's fault, but it's just a realization, a self-introspection that, that this is something I need to do, right? We have a lot of information at our hands. So I would say start researching, start uh, two simple Google searches. There is so much, there is a lot of material. There, is, there are so many resources available on the net that you can read. If you find that to be boring, there are a lot of movies now in the OTT platform that you can look at, which are actually uh, in a very nice and sensitive manner, talking about the lives of people that are different from us. Yeah, and that can be a revelation. And there's some great content on OTT platforms. You can read a book. There are many books written by uh, people from the community, uh, women, people from disability, uh, acid attack survivors. They're all talking about their life stories and, and how life has been. I think reading that, viewing that uh, is, a, is an educational experience. And I think one of the most powerful experiences that you can have, and it's the easiest to do, Vigneshwari, is actually just walk up to a person who is different from you and talk to them. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we tend to align. We, uh, you know, it's called affinity bias, right? We tend to be, um, we, we tend to congregate with people who are similar to us. Right. But like I said, inclusion is a choice. Inclusion is a learned skill. So you have to, if you want to be a leader who is inclusive, it's something that you have to tell yourself that, no, I will talk. I will take out five minutes of my time and actually go up to a person who is extremely different from me and try and learn more about them. The more you talk to them, the more you understand their life story, the more you understand their challenges and, you know, what are the hurdles they face? That's how cobwebs in our minds will get removed. You know, that's how the fog will clear and we'll be able to understand that, you know, these are the lived experiences of, of women or, you know, all of those uh, the marginalized or minority communities, if I may say so. Uh, so that's really the first step, uh, you know, Vigneshwari, for a person who wants to be an ally, right? 
and there are various stages of being an ally you know i can be a quiet ally and i can say okay i'm just going to be quiet and i'm going to observe right i'm going to educate myself and research the next step is actually gathering the courage to go and talk to somebody who is other than my own the third step is to start talking about their issues being an advocate on their behalf right and actually then finally bringing about systemic change in the system it's not only about that one person but actually making the change in such a manner that the institution changes right so that's really the journey of of being an ally and it's a slow journey it's a painful journey but um, it's a journey that will reach that will leave you uh, a much richer person if i may say so sure i'm sure so in your experience um, like where are indian organizations now uh, in terms of allyship Uh, are they being a quiet ally or are they being a very active ally? Uh, where do you see like average organizations put together, uh, even the SMBs and the startups, everything um, hmm. based on your experience? It can be just an opinion, uh, sure. but an expert opinion for us to uh, just uh, calibrate where we are at. So I think, Vikneshwari, it would be um, unfair to kind of say that. an entire organization is um can be summed up as one ally i would say organization are, are at different stages in their dei journey right so there are some organizations that are just beginning they are curious right they are curious they want to know more and they are just beginning and they are kind of looking around for some sort of guidance fumbling around but they are eager right there are also this youth set of organizations for 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 whom this is a non issue right they like uh, we don't want to talk about it right uh, it's it's a non issue for us why should we be talking about uh, dei it's not our business and that's fine too you know then the of course the curious ones which i told you about and then there are there are organizations that are mid journey you know they have started they have set up a council they have a policy you know they have a team that is working on this and they begin their journey and a lot of organizations are in that stage you know two years of dei journey down the line let's say you know and and this is where dei becomes starts becoming part of everyday conversation so when you talk to an employee or you talk to a leader they have a very clear understanding of what dei is right and then there are champions you know then there are champions who are worth emulating because of the number of years they have put behind it and which res- which has resulted in you know a plethora of inclusive policies accessible infrastructure a lot of representation the voice in the room the things that we are talking about that's an actual reality in those organizations unfortunately most of these organizations are multinational companies and we still don't have a very great example to give from an indian company barring a few you know maybe um, godrej maybe uh, you know lemon tree for example or the lalit uh, the lalit surya hospitality uh, these are few indian companies that are working a lot uh, i would say max life insurance has also done uh you know a fair bit of work but i still wouldn't call ourselves a champion you know we are still work in progress and there's a lot that needs to be done but uh, but the fact is that we are committed to it you know it's not something that uh takes a back seat i- irrespective of you know what's happening on the business side right so this just becomes uh something that's ongoing yeah so that is how i would say you know in terms of maturity level for organizations right understood um you have uh, partly answered this question but still i'm going to uh, ask it again because we love to hear you um <laughs> some of the best practices you have seen employers adopting to uh, become a diverse and inclusive workplace you have already pointed out from your personal experience keshav suri foundation Uh, even max life insurance uh, 
so what are the other things that you have read about? Uh, uh, so uh, there are these practices that are worth emulating. Uh, it's very easy. Everybody can just go and do it. So what yeah. are those? So I wouldn't say Vigneshwari that everything is easy to do. Um, I think intent is very important. And then converting that intent into action, you know, um, is, is equally important because many times you find that we are still at intent level. You know, everybody is agreeing that DEI is important, but nobody's doing anything about it. So a few things that are easy to do, right? Very, very easy to do is make your policies gender neutral, right? Make your job descriptions gender neutral. This, this is a very low hanging fruit and can, can be very easily done, right? Um, other things that you can do, I mean, when you talk about sharing best practices, I would say don't be in a rush to uh, formalize everything. I think it's a very sensitive topic. It's a very deep topic and it requires some very... Um, you know, creating that psychologically safe environment where people can be vulnerable and have these conversations. Because we are questioning years of conditioning. You know, we are asking them to change the very basis of their thought process, right? So it will require a lot of breaking down of mental barriers and then, you know, kind of remaking them uh, again in a different manner. So we need to have small, intimate conversations where people can be safe, can, can feel vulnerable to talk about what is it that they have grown up thinking and suddenly start questioning it, challenging it, right? So, um, so I think uh, that's one thing that I would recommend to all organizations that have a lot of these conversations. I think it's very important. That's the that's the basis of you to start your journey of the AI. Um, the, the other thing that I would highly recommend is shine the torch on people who are doing a good job. You know, in, in, in the corporate world, we get very competitive, right? And, and we like to be recognized. So there are champions and you will find champions, you know, to bring out those stories, bring out those stories of success that let's say one manager or one leader in a particular location has gone out of their way, brought in diversity that has helped them to, uh, let's say, bring about valid business improvement and results. That's a case study. And that case study makes it real, you know, is not just a theoretical abstract concept. It makes it real. And that is what becomes very, very easy to replicate for other business leaders that, you know, we already have a case for everyone to see if they can do it, so can we, right? So I think finding those champions and recognizing them and making case studies and so that it's easy for everybody to kind of see how does it come to life? You know, True. it's not just something that's in, in theory, but it's actually real. So I, I would say these two things, you know, there are many Vigneshwari that, that we can and we can spend a whole evening talking about it. But um, I think this is the very basic, you know, just talk about uh, talk about it, have those uh, intimate, safe conversations where people can actually break down uh, their own barriers and reflect and introspect. And the other bit is, you know, finding those DEI champions, making those stories visible to everyone to emulate. Understood. Understood, Richa. Yeah, that's, uh, those are such eye-opening answers, uh, Richa. So for the next uh, five minutes, uh, we'll op uh, open the forum for discussion. Sure. Uh, we already have a question. Uh, so uh, I uh, uh, highly recommend the participants to ask your questions away. Richa is here with us for the next five to 10 minutes. She'll help us with the answers. Uh, you can uh, type your questions uh, in the uh, comment section and then I'll read it out to Richa. So one question that's here is, uh, is term differently abled, legally amended? What is your view on usage of this term instead of PWD? 
Hmm. So just for everybody's information, the right term to use is person with disability. It's always the person first. It's not differently able. It's not specially able. You know, um, all of those titles are incorrect. When you speak to a person with disability, they will tell you, put the person first. So if it's, let's say, a blind person, then the correct term to use is person with visual disability. We don't say deaf or we don't say dumb. We say a person with speech and hearing disability. Okay, so it's always the person first and the disability later. Okay, please, uh, my recommendation and suggestion is to refrain from using specially able, differently able. Got it, got it, Richard. The next question is how to involve everyone when the organization is still in the hybrid mode? Um, I think the answer is how to, uh, in, I mean, I think the question is how to, uh, you know, involve everybody in this inclusion process to make diversity heard uh, mm -hmm. when people are working in multiple locations, uh, mm -hmm. when people don't gather at the same time. Mm -hmm. Richard. Well, you know, Vigneshwari, we've learned to do business on an online uh, medium also, right? It's pretty much the same. Think of it like any business problem to solve, right? How are we conducting business in a virtual uh, manner? We set up meetings, you know, we, we set up a tag team or a cross-functional team. We go about writing, articulating a problem statement, the, the resources we need, and we go about with a plan. And, you know, that's how we execute most of the projects in organizations. You have to treat it like that. You have to project manage it, uh, create a cross-functional team. Don't be a lone wolf, you know, get more people in the game. And uh, that's that's the way to do it, whether virtual or physical. I think in virtual, you have even a greater capacity to talk about DEI because you are including a set of people, like I said, who were probably not included earlier. You know, more women are preferring to work in a, in a setup that, that allows them to work from home uh, than otherwise. So this is even better for your uh, DEI journey, right? Right, right. And the next question, Richa, is any suggestions for startups in introducing and implementing DAI? If I take DAI to my manager, he might come up with a reason such as small workforce, lack of funds, so on and so forth. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. So, um, you know, I think, like I said, it's very important to articulate the problem statement. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Are you doing it just because everybody else is doing it? Because what I understand is that most startups are naturally inclusive, right? Because it's a young workforce, right? It's a small setup. We see more women, more young people working in startups. The attraction to work in startups is more. They are naturally inclusive. So what is the problem here? Um, are there any biases that you feel that need to be worked upon? Do you think that you need to have a more inclusive, uh, let's say, infrastructure, more policies, all of that, then, then you have to be very clear about the problem statement and then go up to your founder, CEO to say that this is a problem we need to solve, right? Please approach this, like I said again, please approach this like a business problem. First, be very, very clear about the, the problem that you're trying to solve, yeah? Got it. Understood, Richard. So a, any other questions? All right. So <clears throat> thank you for your time, Richard. Uh, I think there is one more question. Yeah. What basic DNI policies we can implement in mid-sized form? Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question to ask because it doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't matter on the size of the firm, right? Uh, you're in either inclusive or you're, or you're not. Um, yes, I do uh, agree that there's a certain amount of budget you require to do large scale DNI events, activities, initiatives. But your question is around policies. 
right? What kind of policies we can implement in a mid DNI firm? I think few policies that I can think from on the top of my head are parental leave, you know, uh, adoption leave, um, making, uh, let's say, giving caregiving leave, menstrual leave. Um, and you might be thinking I'm only talking about leaves, but <laughs> we're talking about policies, uh, you know, work from home, the ability to have uh, a decision, uh, decision making power in order to, you know, decide your work timing. So basically, in short, flexibility, you know, do I have the power to decide my work timings? Uh, that's a very, very important factor in order to retain, you know, uh, what kind of tools am I able to give to my people who are working from home? Right? What kind of resources can I give them? Uh, so, so, you know, these are few policies. I think, like I said in the beginning, uh, make all your policies gender neutral. Make all your job descriptions gender neutral. I think that's that's an important thing. It's very, very easy to make your company website accessible for people with disability. It's a very small thing you need to do. That's a low-hanging fruit. Ask your uh, person who takes care of IT. Ask them this question and this problem, I mean, this uh, change can be done within a matter of one or two days. You know, uh, all of these plugins are available. You know, Microsoft is in, has done some phenomenal work, uh, you know, when it comes to all of this. So all of these plugins are available. You just have to kind of activate. So it's like that. Um, you know, for, for, for the Gen Z, I think... Um, not having a very strict dress code is also an important thing, right? And I say that not, not because we want people to wear jeans to office, no. I'm talking about uh, people who are non-binary, you know, people who don't identify as a specific gender. But if we say that, you know, men will wear suits and women will wear skirts or saris, then you are kind of making that binary uh, very, very clear. So having that freedom to dress the way I want to dress, right? Because that has got nothing to do with my work, right? But it's got everything to do with who I am as a person, right? Um, crash benefit, Vigneshwari. I would be you know, very happy to share that Max Life is one of the very few companies that have introduced crash benefit for their employees, right? Um, a crash assistance program, which is accessible to both genders, uh, to all genders, and saying that, you know, this is a, this is a list of pan-India available crashes, right? We've partnered with, a, with another firm, which has given a database of 6,000 crashes. All of these crashes are audited, verified crashes. That's a big peace of mind you're giving to your employee. And you're talking to them that, yes, you know, what you're indicating by giving this is that I care about you as a person. You know, you're not just a resource for me. You are a person who has other responsibilities apart from work. So if I'm a working mother or a working parent, child caregiving is a very big responsibility of my life. True. And how is the company assisting? Now companies are also talking about elderly care. Because a lot of us, have migrated to different cities and our parents are in different cities, you know, and, and there's a constant struggle for people to say that, you know, how can I be there for my parents without actually compromising on my career? And that's a very difficult choice many professionals end up taking. We either uproot ourselves or we uproot our parents, right? Depending on this, depending on our individual uh, situation. And now there are professional companies that are uh, providing care to the elderly people living in other cities, medical care, even just regular day-to-day -day care. Safety of women is a very, very big, important thing as well. I think that's a policy you should immediately implement. We've seen that uh, in multinational companies, you know, there are cabs that pick up and drop uh, at and um, you know if it's not at the in the night or late late evening i think that should be a standard policy across all organizations um and i know that there are 
big companies, multinational companies who say that if a woman is traveling, she's seen a, you know, woman who's traveling for work, has a baby, the baby and the nanny can travel with the lady and that um, expense will be taken care of by the company, right? So, of course, I truly recognize that a lot of these companies, a lot of these policies, there is a certain cash flow, uh, you know, cash outage over here. There is some sort of a commitment that will be required from the company, but there are things that don't require any money, right? For ex Which is what I said that, you know, gender neutral uh, and, and stuff like that. So these are easy to implement and easy to do. And for example, even if you're a mid-sized firm and you offer health insurance to your employees, right? Uh, and usually in health insurance, your partner is covered, right? Your mm -hmm. spouse is covered. What stops us from saying that, you know, the definition of spouse is expanded to a partner? But, yeah. Yeah. And very easily you can do it. And now health insurance companies are agreeing for it. Exactly. So, so that's, again, a low-hanging fruit, where, which you can very easily do. Right. So those are something that came from the top of, on the top of my head. It's not an exhaustive list, but uh, something I could think of. Sure, then, sure, uh, Richard. So uh, we are taking the last question uh, for this session. Uh, are there any specific activities that can be conducted to raise awareness among employees, especially when most of them are unaware of DEI and are new to such concepts? Yeah. Yeah. So for this, I would say capitalize on days right? Days which are celebrated internationally and nationally. So for example, International Women's Day, yeah? The June Pride Month, uh, the Idaho Bit Day, for example, International Day Against uh, Homophobia, right? So these are days that are recognized internationally. I would say capitalize on these days and make it a point to conduct an event or a talk, you know, get an expert speaker, um, or a person from the community to talk about it. Um, you know, all companies have uh, something or the other on Diwali and et cetera, right? When you have, when you're asking for vendors to set up stalls, get people who, who are from the community, you know, so that you have representation. There are a lot of these small businesses who are doing some very nice work, you know, when you're setting up, let's say Diwali Mela, right? You can have people from, um, and I know for an, of an organization called Pride Circle that regularly organizes Rainbow Bazaar. Yeah. 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 So that's such an easy thing for you to do. And very subtly, you're exposing your uh, organization, your set of employees to the people of the community. And when they interact, you know, even if they go and go to their counter to purchase a product, that's an interaction. And slowly that fear that I was talking about will get dispelled, you know. Even a counter, let's say, uh, even uh, a small kiosk by a person with disability who has something to sell. So there is a, there's an organization called Atypical Advantage. That, that is a platform which showcases skills. It could be singing, dancing, anything. And all of these performers are people with disability. So imagine on your annual day, every company has an annual day or a founder's day or something like that. One of the performances is by, by such a performer. Imagine it is not only a, a, an act of entertainment. You're actually sensitizing all of the people sitting in the audience. And that's a clever way of seeding things um, related to DEI. You know, there's a beautiful collective called the Aravani Art Project, the, uh, which is based in Bangalore. It is a collective of transgender artists. They go and paint very large murals, you know. So when they come to your premise and I give them a big wall to paint and all of them are painting, it, it's not a day activity. It takes them a few days. Employees are coming, going, seeing what is happening. You put a small placard over there to say, you know, what is the project all about. We did that in Max Life, you know, and there was a lot of buzz around it. And slowly, that is how you seed in conversation. Because otherwise, you tell them, you know, this training is happening, please all come. Then people come with a certain mindset to a training. I think you just have to be creative. You just have to be creative. And these are ways of 
of doing it. I'm definitely inspired by this answer, uh, Richa. I'm sure a lot of the participants are also quite uh, inspired by this. Um, I think we can uh, all do a little bit so that uh, uh, it becomes like a, a massive revolution. Mm. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, it is going to take us uh, another few more years before this becomes very mainstream. This becomes a boring topic. I hope that one day it comes. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time, Richa. All of us have a lot of points to go reflect upon, to discuss with our own teams. I have uh, made notes uh, like through for like few pages. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a truly enlightening session, Richa. Uh, thank you, so thank much. you very much for your time. And thank you very much, uh, participants, for making this a very, very engaging session. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.